So a moment ago, Eric read for us part of Matthew's, we call it the Christmas story. And it's that part of the story that happens just after the Magi from the east arrive. And you may recall that when they arrive in Jerusalem, they go to the palace of Herod, looking for the newborn king of the Jews. And Matthew tells us that when Herod heard that there was a newborn king of the Jews, it says, Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. So you may recall that Herod ascertained from the Magi the time that they saw the star at its rising and invited the Magi to come back and tell him when they found the Christ child, alleging that he wanted to worship the child as well. And we know that was a ruse. And then an angel of the Lord came to the Magi in a dream and told them that Herod had no good intention. And so they went back home by another way. So the section that Eric read for us was right after the Magi had left. That angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said to take the, the mother and the child and escape to Egypt because Herod would try to kill the child. The few verses in between what Eric read and what I'm going to read are those awful verses, often referred to as the massacre of the innocents, where Herod, in order to try to do away with the newborn king of the Jews, had all the Hebrew boys, age two and under, killed in that area. It's a tragic story, and our reading picks up right after that. Listen for the word of God. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. And there he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. This ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God of grace, as we hear a tragic story of violence and, and fear, and as we hear a story of restoration of the Holy Family returning to their home. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see the stories of those who are refugees seeking safety in our world today. Amen. About 35 years ago, just about this time of year, I was serving a Pentecostal holiness church in Richmond, Virginia. And being kind of the low person in the hierarchy of the staff, they left it to me to be in charge of entertainment during the Christmas party. So I decided that uh, to do a Christmas trivia quiz. And I started looking through all of my resources and everything, and, and, and I found a really nice one from the Youth Specialties uh, resource that was pretty good, but it was kind of small and could be better. So I worked, with it on, uh, worked on it several months, and I came up with a 10-question Christmas trivia quiz where all of the answers to the quiz were taken directly from the scriptures. And so we went into the party and everybody was sitting at round tables and I gave them the quiz and they were to discuss it among themselves at their table and then each table was to answer the quiz and, and you know, circled letters A, B, C, D, or E. And um, one of the tables had the pastor there, you know, he had been serving there for about 38 years, so everybody figured they'd win, hands down. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to confess to you, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinful man, because uh, I kind of take delight 
in the fact that none of them did well, <laughs> including the pastor's table. I think they got four out of ten. And the thing you should know about Pentecostal holiness people is they know their Bible. We were fairly convinced that heaven has a Bible entrance exam that you had to pass before you could stay there, and we studied our whole life for it. So Pentecostal holiness people know their Bible. But the Christmas story is kind of different because for us it's informed not only by the written text, but it's also informed by the pageant and by the carols and by the songs you hear at the mall and, and, and the movies that are on television and the plays we watch and so forth. And many of us are kind of misinformed about the particulars. So this was a trivia quiz, picking up on the particulars. And um, I'm going to hand it to these folks as we were going through question by question. I let them get their Bibles out, you know, it was a closed book exam when they uh, took the quiz. And uh, we opened our Bibles and I'd give them chapter and verse. And I, I will tell you, they begrudgingly gave it up for me. Say, so, you're right, that's exactly what it says right there. I always thought it said something else, you know. And some of them even thanked me for helping them to learn the story a little bit better. All the way through the first ten questions. But things changed when we got to question number 11. Because it was a different kind of question. That week in the Washington Post, there had been a story about a sculpture that an artist had created in Washington, D.C. of Mary and Joseph huddled with the baby over a steam grate. A very familiar sight in large cities, particularly in cold cities, where people uh, will sleep over a steam grate in order to enjoy the heat that comes out of that. And, and so this artist had depicted the Holy Family as a homeless family huddled over a steam grate. And my question, the last question on the quiz was, is this a promising way to think about the Christmas story? And table after table after table, table, table said no. And I was hoping, I was hoping that once they had their confidence shattered a little bit, you know, by, by realizing we don't know the particulars of the question quite as well as we think we do, that perhaps they would be humbled a little bit into thinking that when it comes to the interpretation of the meaning of the story, maybe there's more to it than we ever imagined. But the answer remained no. And in fact, in the end, I was told, you're just trying to make this story politically correct. Now, I, I think I admitted to you a moment ago I'm a sinful man. Um, for many years, I kind of stewed on this, and I was, I, my consternation has always wanted me to say that, uh, you know, you're just, you're just hypocrites. You say you love the Bible, you say you submit to the scriptures, and yet you won't open to the possibility that the scriptures are saying something that makes you uncomfortable. You know, I wanted to get on my high horse, a very, very high horse, and just trod over those folks. I said trod, that's the King James word. That means I'm being really biblical, right? And I was just going to get those folks. Um, but what I've learned in time is that instead of being on this high horse, I should lean into why they resisted that interpretation of the Christmas story and to try to appreciate what it is they were fearful of in that resistance. Not, not to agree with them, but to understand them. And I think it has to do with this. The Christmas story is for us a, a different in kind than a lot of other biblical stories. Like if someone told us, you know, the story of Zacchaeus had a, had a little thing about it we didn't know, we'd say, okay, and we'd let it go. Or if someone told us, you know, there's a story over here, the blind man, that we should read this way, that's a little different than we've ever read it, then, then we, we might be open to that. But... The Christmas story is a little different because we're not just invested in it uh, with our minds. We're really invested with our whole being. Because this is a story that, and, and, and I'm 
and I agree with this, it, we feel all the feels of the story. We, 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 we get it. We, we've sung these carols with generations who have now passed. And when we sing these carols again, it's almost like we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses as we sing. We're, we're joining something bigger than ourselves. And, and, and many of us, we've had children that have been in the Christmas pageants, and so that kind of gets us, you know, where you like to be got sometimes. And, and, and there's just this kind of uh, um, a soulful connection that we have to the Christmas story that we, don't, we just don't always have with other stories that we hear on occasion. And so I understand that when someone starts to question the way we've always interpreted the story, because we're so deeply invested in the story, we, we might hear that as someone challenging the story itself. And I really suspect the resistance I was feeling from them was something like, that's one of my really sacred places, and you are not allowed to go in there and disrupt the furniture. And, 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 and I get that, but I, but I do want to push back on it, right? And say that if it really is for us a meaningful story and not simply a sentimental story, but a meaningful story about who God is when God is with us, then we should open our minds and allow others, even the artistic community particularly, to enable us to embrace this story differently. So today, I just want to offer you a couple of ways of looking at the story that we've read from Matthew's Gospel about the Magi, that, that kind of addendum epiphany story that's part of the Christmas story we celebrate every year. And first of all, I just want to invite you to, to think of it this way. The Christmas story should not be treated as a standalone story. It, it, we do that during the season of Christmas because that's the emphasis. But within the scriptures themselves, the Christmas story is part of the, the whole story of the Christ. And so when we read the Christmas story, we're also reading the story that includes the childhood of Jesus, and it includes the teachings of Jesus, and the healing stories of Jesus, and, and, and those great miracle stories that we read, and the story of Jesus' betrayal, and his trial, and his suffering, and his death, and his resurrection. This is a story of one cloth. We're focusing on one part of it because that's the season among us. But, but, but it's not a separate story. It's part of one cloth. So I want to invite you to stand on this end of the story for a moment and look back at the Christmas story, particularly Matthew's epiphany story, from the perspective of the death and resurrection of Christ. Because when we read the story of the death and resurrection of Christ, what we see is that God's way of being with us is that God is in deep solidarity with all of those who have ever been abandoned, betrayed by their closest companions, found guilty in a kangaroo court that was stacked against them, all of those who have been beaten savagely, all of those who have been murdered under the guise of blasphemy and sedition. When we read the story of the death and then the resurrection of Jesus, where this one who was treated that way is now proclaimed as Lord and Savior of the world, when we read the story from that perspective, it, it's not a stretch to imagine that even in the birth story, Jesus is identifying with those folks who have no home, with those folks who are refugees, who have to, as we heard in our story, flee their home and go to Egypt of all places in order to find asylum. When we read the story of the Christmas uh, event through the lens of the resurrection and the death of Christ, what we see is this is God's way of being with us, identifying with those who are used and abused in our world. So maybe that artist had a point. 
that one of the nice ways of depicting the, the, uh, the, the holy family is not so much snug and warm inside of a stable that kind of gives us a homey feeling, but maybe they found that manger out in the middle of a field somewhere and they're doing everything they can to protect this child against the elements because there was no room for them. And when we read the story of the holy family fleeing their home to live in Egypt until the tyrant is dead, Maybe it's a little better to depict them instead of having halos over their head, hiding in the shadows and doing their best to escape. You see the difference it makes when we look at the Christmas story as part of the whole story that includes the death and resurrection of Christ. And another way that we can read Matthew's story particularly is that Matthew is really steeped in the Old Testament tradition. And when he's writing this story for us, he expects us to be steeped in it as well. And this is where we stand when we hear this story. You remember last year during Advent, we had the pictures of the four women up here and the roots coming out of there. And those of you who were here, our theme was from these roots. And we, we look particularly at the stories of these four women who are mentioned in Matthew's genealogy. And in that genealogy, Matthew is identifying for us, this is the role genealogies play, particularly in the third world even today. It identifies for us who someone is. And you might recall that Matthew gives three sets of generations, 14 generations each. And we often recall that one of them goes back to King David. Because for us, Jesus is the child of King David. That's what the Messiah was going to be, of the lineage of David. And we might recall one of them goes back to Abraham, which puts Jesus right squarely in the middle of the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. But the first set of generations that Matthew identifies goes back to the exile. So if you want to call Jesus the son of David, the king, or if you want to call Jesus the son of Abraham, the child of the promise, we also have to call Jesus the son of exiles. Because this is his story. And this is the story into which Jesus is born. It's a story of a people who had been ripped from their land and sent abroad against their will. So whether we read Matthew from the crucifixion and the resurrection backwards or whether we stand in the Old Testament and read Matthew from the beginning forward each time he wants us to see that the Holy Family is is part of this ongoing story of refugees seeking asylum in the world A few months ago, Nathan Gardles wrote in the World Post that asylum for many years was considered the moral imperative of countries. The moral imperative because anyone who could not live in their home country because of violence or fear or tyranny or something like that, they were always, always expected to find a place in the country of their choosing. And there was a moral imperative among good countries, countries that considered themselves just countries, to welcome refugees and to find a place for them. But Nathan Gardles points out that things have changed over the years. It has nothing to do with current presidents or former presidents. This is not a partisan political statement. It's an historical statement about how things have changed because more and more refugees that are seeking asylum are not coming from countries with tyrants. They're coming from countries that may be our friends, but countries that can't protect them from the violence within. So, for example, back in the day, if someone were to come here from Nazi Germany, well, we would take them and it was part of our, our, our battle against the, uh, the evil fascist regime and we felt a certain moral imperative of welcoming them. But what happens today when someone comes from El Salvador? Because this is not a country that's on our list. They're one of our friends. 
We have commercial interest in El Salvador. We have ministerial interest in El Salvador. But we have people coming from these countries because their country cannot protect them against gang violence and other forms of violence that they see. And it's changed our attitude toward asylum to where we have put the burden of proof on the refugee to convince us that they're worthy of entrance. Do you see the difference? Historically, it was like, of course, this is the moral imperative. You cannot live in the violence in which you exist, so you are welcomed here. And now it's like, you have to prove to us that you're a victim. And then you can start the process. It's very different. So if ever there were a people who needed to hear the story of Advent, the preparation of coming of the Christ, if there ever were a people who need to hear Luke's phrase that there was no room in the end or Matthew's story of the Holy Family seeking asylum in Egypt, it is us. And may God transform us through this incredible story. Amen.